uh, I will leave it up to you, Dara, to give us the rules of how you want them to participate throughout the workshop, whether you want them uh, to ask questions on the fly or you prefer that they ask questions when you say, do you guys have any questions? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, we started the recording and uh, again, just everybody, please keep your uh, mics and cameras off. Thank you, Dara. Go ahead. Good luck. Thank you. OK, hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. I got the, uh, a little problem on my headphone at the, uh, the last 60 seconds, <laughs> but I uh, I solved the problem anyway. Um, so today we want to talk about Golang, and um, so I'm going to share my screen with you guys. <clears throat> and I'm going to share with you one document that there are a couple of links on this document. So you take that document from the general. I'm going to upload it now. And then it will be easier for you to follow along. So these are the instructions on how to install Go. So I give you like a minute. Just go to the general and take this document, which is here. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I want to thank a special thank to all my teachers. As you all know, I have been student at La Salle about 20 years ago. And uh, these people who are here, most of them were my teacher. And uh, you can't hear me well. Is, is, this, is this good now? I'm on the maximum of. OK, so so Fateh, I, I think I think it's your. All right. All right. Cool. Cool. Thank you. So I think it's your. Uh, <clears throat> it's your headphone. Yeah, I was saying that a uh, special thank to my. Most of the teacher here, they were my teacher at La Salle well, years ago, but thanks for your precious time to be here and just your your faces. Uh, it gives me support. Thanks a lot. All right. All right, so let's, uh, before, because we just have two hours, first of all, about the question, I'm gonna leave at the end, like 20 minutes for the question, because just write down your question and please uh, ask them at the end, or we're gonna have a break in between. Usually in the two hours workshop, we have like 10 minutes. You can ask your question at the end of first period and at the end of the second period. So it will be easier to uh, follow like this uh, because I have a I have a program and if and you are many and if I want to debug people that doesn't work, you know it. But uh, the good news is this is recorded. If after this introduction to Golang, you are interested in continuing with Go, then you can, uh, you have access to this video on YouTube channel, on the Int YouTube channel, so you can go through it. So don't be frustrated if, if there is a step you cannot do with me. If there is something you don't understand, it's okay. I will be available at college, you know, almost every day I'm there. So, um, and you can re-watch the, the video. So just, uh, just follow as long as you can. If you cannot follow, just listen. And we go from there. All right. So before everything, fast, I want to go through the installation of Go. And um, so here I put some links about free books. Uh, these are free books, and these are these are good references. You want to ask questions? There is a forum, of course, the Stack Overflow. And so let's go with the language specification. So I have some links here about the language specification. So we have this, the language specification. These are the Google specification. Golang belongs to Google. Uh, two parts which are very important in here, if you want to navigate it after all, this is these packages. These packages are part of the standard library of Golang. And uh, we have about 100 packages 
in uh, 34, 35 different categories. And so all the packages are here. So suppose I want to do, I want to find something like string. So I just control F here, string. So I have a string package, string implements simple functions to manipulate string. I click on it. Then I have all the functionalities of the package string. Golang, it's uh, very direct and it's very easy to find the stuff in the package string. I'm going to do again, control F, I'm going to do upper. So here we go, function upper string. If I want to use, I want to make my string upper. This is the function upper. We have an example here and so on. So that was the part of uh, this part of it. No, the latest version is not 1.16. We're going to get there is uh, the latest version. So if we go to this link here that you have it on PDF, so golang.org, which is here, this is the link, golang.org. You have it on the PDF. Then you see that featured downloads you have here, Microsoft Windows, for Windows, this is the last version, 1.17.3, and this is an MSI file, which means it's an exe file. I just go down, I have the same thing here on the stable version, so the same link, I have it here too, you see, here. So if I click on it, then I'm, I'm going to get, this is 125 meg, Let's get downloading, okay? So let's go back. Meanwhile, it's downloading. Let's go back to our PDF here. We have this playgolang.org. And uh, what is this display Golang? It's an online compiler. And uh, you don't need to do an installation of Go. Okay, it's limited, but um, it's, it's good. And as soon as you open it, you get this hello world uh, go. I can just change this to word. This is a hello world go. If you run this, then you have it. This is the client server architecture. And you get and you make a request to the server and it's create an HTML uh, on the fly and it send it to you. And this is the HTML result for you and it says hello world so you see this is string between these two double quote has been uh, uh, created here so hello world the cool thing about this is i don't know if you recall or no but google had uh, that short link like google goo.gl and they they stop it it's 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 no more supported by google but i think they have integrated here if you write this code and you click on share and it's create a url for you here and this url you can just copy the url and you can send it to a friend and you say oh here is my code so you have the code so this is a cool thing about this uh playground okay so let's go back to our installation here and here, these are some links that I, I made, I think last year, and I tried some of them and they are still working. So if I click on any of them, then you see this is a small piece of code that I have created and still they keep for how long they keep it, I don't know, but they are still there available to us. All right, so I forgot to change here something on the PowerPoint. This is an older version. This is the last time that we did such an installation and I used the same PowerPoint. I made the, the changes in the upcoming slide, but on this one I forgot. So suppose this is 1.17. And as you can see, so we have here a SHA-256 checksum here. What is it, this checksum? I mean, it's worth explaining it like two minutes. Actually, 
at the, this is a repository and I'm going to get this from a Google server and these packages, this 125 meg, they're coming by packages from different paths and they are coming to my machine and it's reassembled. So this SHA-256 is an algo that based on this file is creating this key. It's, it doesn't matter what is it, this algo. If to this algo, to this black box, we just give this as an input, it's gonna create us a key here. And this key will change. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so please close, make sure that your mic is closed, guys. All right. So if one bit between the Google server and the client is changed, somebody changes or it's broken, this key will change. Okay. So I put here in the PowerPoint, if we go down on, on Windows, this is the comment on Windows to check if my file is okay, and this is with the older version again. So if I go to, so before the installation, I just want to check if this thing is really coming from Google. So that's the story behind it. And it's good to know that we could do such a thing. So I'm gonna just right click on this, on the rename. I'm gonna get the name, so with the right version. So I'm gonna launch CMD here. <clears throat> so I'm in the users, right? I go to downloads. I'm in the download. And now here it is here. What I, I can do a deer here to see what I have in the downloads. Then I see that I have the file here. So I can do a cert until so you can do it with me if you want. The hash file, right? Then we put the file name. So here is the file name, and I'm inside the directory, so I don't, I don't need to put the full path. So just the name of the file. I have an MSI at the end, and I just write SHA-256. I do enter, and it's going to create me this key. It says, hey, the file at your end, uh, if you put it in that SHA-256, here is the key that is creating, then I can compare it with the key that I have here, or in their website, maybe it's, it's more clear on their website. It's this one. Then I can make sure that there is nothing which has been changed in this file. So this is just a security, uh, so I'm gonna make Smaller. So now I have the key, right? This is the key from the Google site, and this is the key from my site. Then I put them and I make sure that this is the same key. So it's really nobody has changed even a single byte of this and the way to get it. So I just wrote it in the PowerPoint and you can see it from there. Uh, I just find this before the presentation. You see, this is an online show. I am at school. Learning Go, and it's creating me, and this is a 256, it's creating me this key. So I want you just to look at this key here. Just look at the key. If I change one character, actually if I change one byte, I don't even need to change one character, but let's say I put L, you see the whole key is changing the whole key is changing. So that's why we are making, this is a security uh, things that we, it's good to know. All right, so then after that, you have the file. I did my installation, you just do double click on the MSL file. This is the first, just, just click, click, click. This is the first one. Uh, you give it the, I think this is the, the default path. I, I don't remember when I was doing this, I didn't change the path, this is the default path to see program file, go, and this is important to know. And okay, so I took a print screen of this, and then we are, um, we have the installation. All right, 
once you have the installation, again on CMD, we can just do go version. If you have the version and like any other software, you could have different versions installed. So just make sure that you have the right version 117.2. And so you usually good to good to go if you your machine sees it here on the command line means that your environment variable has been set. But we're going to check it together our environment variable. I do an EMV in the search box. My environment variable. I have my user environment variable and for the whole system. So this is if I have different users. I, I like it that they, they did it like separated like that. I go to my path, I do an edit, I just open it a little bit more, and I search for go, and I see that it has been added here. So you see the same place that is, has this installation C program files, and go add to the bin package, of course, and if you don't have it, you know, for any reason, just manually you add it here and make sure that manually you go to your folder to see the installation have been in this place, not another place. So uh, and you have to point on this bin here. All right. Now for the well, first of all, when we have this, um, if we can go we can do, uh, I, I mean, we can, we, can, we can run the compiler on the command line, but on the command line, it's not really, uh, really cool. This is my hello world. I just copied this. I uh, actually, I have this test here, right? Okay, so I'm gonna open a notepad, plus, plus. Then I'm gonna paste what I have got over there that I do a save as. <clears throat> so I go this part fast because it's not even important, but anyway, you have the recording, right? So I'm going to call it main.go. So this extension of go is mandatory here in order to see that this is a go file. And I have this, uh, how do you call it? This, I don't know, this, this icon here. And because I have GoLand, that we're going to talk about it in, in two minutes, I'm going to open my CMD. I'm going to get to this uh, place. <coughs> so I just, I have it here, my main.go, and I see it on my GUI too. Then I do go run main.go. <coughs> so I'm running directly my file a hello world, but this is not the best place. I, you know, but I just wanted to tell you that we don't necessarily need an IDE in order to do this, but well, if we have an IDE, why not? So most of you, you have VS code uh, on your machine. And uh, I find here it's very nice link, a, a blog that somebody just wrote a blog and we're gonna go through that, that said, if you have VS Code and you want to use uh, Golang on VS Code, what you should do. So this link, you have it on the PDF. I'm gonna just close this thing, close this thing. Um, okay, so this is a link to get Visual Studio Code. If any of you don't have Visual Studio Code, this is the link, Visual Studio Code and you, you just click on Windows, if you are on Windows, most of you, and you just do next, 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 and you have Visual Studio Code. So this is an ID from Microsoft. All right, this is the link that this guy, Kotaka, Kotaka, Taji, Kotaka, Takaji, wrote for us. And so let me just launch VS Code. So let me go to the VS Code. All right, so this is my VS Code. So if I go to see what 
Akachi wrote me the most important part is here. Okay, open the extension marketplace, comment shift X. So you have to do a comment shift X here. If you have the, uh, I mean, comment shift X is on Apple. So here will be common control shift X. Then I have the marketplace open. I just write go. Then I have go. I click on it. You probably, if you didn't do the installation, you have here install. Then you're going to install this extension for Visual Studio. Me, I already did it, so I don't need it. So it's going to take like 30 seconds. You add it. Then there is another part here. After that, you do Control Shift P. So we're going to go here and we're going to do again Control Shift P. And in Control Shift P, you see install update tools. So you have this update tools. Again, mine is updated, but again, I'm going to just select all of them. I'm going to do OK. And start to updating and it says succeed, succeed. At the end, it's going to write to me. You are good to go. All right. So meanwhile, it does because it's going to take like two, three minutes. I'm going to see if we have question that we have to answer. All right, so again, guys, we want to scratch the surface of Golang, and my whole goal is just to make you uh, like uh, interested to this language, which is Go, which is part of our kind of a new trend. So you are ready to go. You see, if you see this, you are ready to go, then you are ready to go. So if there are, you know, we have different levels here of, of a student and I, I am very new in Go. So I am I am a student in, in terms of Go too. So if there are some part that you miss, don't get frustrated. I have been a student for many years and but just understand me if I want to slowly do the installation as I would do in class. And it would, you know, we could spend one hour to do this and debug everybody, then we cannot do our workshop. But I will be there even after workshop, even at school to support you. Don't get frustrated, don't get, just follow along and we're going to do it once we see each other together. Okay. And you have the recording. Okay. All right. So I execute a Go file. So this is my file here. This is the cut and paste of my, uh, the hello world. What I have here fast, I have a package main. So this is my function main. Uh, just I open a parenthesis because I have a student in C++ or C or C++ language. And I want to get your attention how it's similar to C language or to C++ language. So finally, I have a main here and um, I have an import. So in, in C++, we do an include here, IO stream. And here I have an input of FMT. What is FMT? It's a format package which has the, the responsibility of IO stream in C++. This is a package main in Go, the scope of the variables and functions are based on the package. So writing the name of the package is important. The package which holds the main method, which is the entry point like C++ of the, of the application, we put it in the package main, okay? So, and this is an FMT, okay? It's like the C out here, okay? Well, we write the name of the package, then we have a println, then in, you know, inside the parentheses, we have this double quote. And if you know different languages and you are at the end of the, the college or you are advanced and you know different languages, you can do the, the reference between different languages when you look at this. <clears throat> okay, 
All right, so now that we went through very fast, went through the installation, I'm gonna talk about like 10, 15 minutes theory to introduce you Go. So for people who are struggling the installation, they can use this time, which is theory, in order to see if they can you know, solve the problem. After that, we're gonna do some coding and so you can follow along uh, with me. All right, so oh, I forgot to tell you that this is uh, the way of VS Code and we have another extraordinary uh, IDE, which is the from JetBrain and it's Goland. The name is Goland and I put it here. Everything is perfect about this Goland, except that it's not free. Well, you could download it and you can you see free 30 day trial and you can use it for 30 day. And after that you have to pay and it's, it's pretty expensive. But VS Code does the job. <coughs> so at, at school level, you don't need to go on Goland. But anyway, I, I, I knew I find this and I thought maybe it's a good thing to, uh, to introduce it uh, to you guys. Okay, so let's go to the second document that I, I'm going to give you whatever we do. I'm going to give you at the end of the workshop, but let, let me just get everything organized and I'm going to give it to you. So why go language here? My idea or the idea or the objective is to give some um, credibility to Golang. Well, First of all, Go belongs to Google. So who is Google? Well, the most important or one of the two, three most important uh, companies in, in technology. So back in 2005, they say we want our own language. We are on own specification. So Java is not good enough. C++ is not good enough. Um, I don't know, name it. Ruby is not good enough and so on. So they write their own specification and do not forget the specification. Each language is the best for something and Go is the best in order to do website on a big scale or web services on a big scale. So this is what uh, Google does, right? So the it goes on that something else in the specification they wanted to make uh, uh, I mean, uh, among the quality attributes, the maintenance of the application written in Go should be easy. So these are the two that keep in mind that the maintenance should be easy. And the, the other one is they are making web services on a bigger scale. So these are the most important part. Who they call? Well, <laughs> these three gentlemen, the Ken Thompson, Thompson, uh, Rob Pike, and Robert Griserman. These are uh, people uh, behind C language. These are people behind Linux. These are genius. And most importantly, these are these three individuals. These are uh, behind the object oriented paradigm, the OOP. So Google called them. And they say, I want you to be responsible for my new language. And they start taking the specification and they do uh, based on what they say the best language ever existed. OK, do not forget these people are behind object oriented paradigm. So for the last 35, 40 years, we have how many languages and that support object So these people are behind that. All right. So this part, I'm going to just pass it fast, fast. I, I want to just tell you that uh, Go compiles much faster than C++. OK, I repeat, Go compiles much faster than C++. In the terms of execution, Go is as uh, almost as fast as C++. Go has an extraordinary library for the parallel concurrency, which is a huge problem, for instance, in Java. And Go is the first language that natively supports multi-cores. So the first Intel multi-core came out 
maybe I, 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 I make a mistake on the year for one year, I think in 2006, and Go came out in the same year, or Go came out in 2006 and the first multiple came out in 2007, something like that. Well, are they connected to each other? <laughs> well, these are the kind of the, the bosses of IT. So it, maybe they can make a call to Intel and tell them, oh, can you make us a multi-core? Maybe they did it, I don't know. So it has a powerful standard library. I showed you in the documentation, we have about 100 packages. Some of them are embedded in the other one, about 35 different categories. It's a garbage collected language, okay? And it's portable, and it's portable. So you're gonna read about it. It's backed by Google, it's open source. They made it open source back in 2011 or 12. But this is not uh, all of it. So we have some comparison here. So this is the sources here. If you are not, if you use Go and you are not agree, you can contact this person and tell him why is that, how he did his calculation. I have no clue, but um, so you see here on the x's, x axis, we have fast. So C and C++ are the fastest one, right? And languages like Python interpreted, like Ruby, like JavaScript, these are uh, less fast than, of course, Java, than C++ and C. But it put here Go at the same level of Java. So I, I don't want to talk about it for a long time, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not I agree because I have seen other papers that it put it almost at the same level of C++ anyway. And fast and fun for a human, well, it's, so this is my Y axis, I go up, this is fun for human, well, JavaScript, I don't know, fun for human, maybe for, for younger generation, but for me it's super annoying. Um, anyway, I, I don't know how, what was, how many people they took, how, how they did it, but anyway. Then it's a beautiful and straight code. So on the X axis, you see that Go is very beautiful and straight code. So you're gonna find it a little bit bizarre when we, you, we do a little bit of coding. So I don't know who told them that straight code, yes, but beautiful, I'm not sure. Anyway, you're gonna check it here to see. I just want to finish this by saying one more thing. Many of you heard about Node.js. Node.js is a runtime, which uh, somebody, some smart person thought if uh, I can execute JavaScript outside of the browser, then I can do front end and back end with JavaScript. And he created Node.js. And it was revolutionary because now we could have, you know, all those 10 mini stack I don't know what a stack, and they go from front end to the back end. They do JavaScript. Well, is it a good thing? I don't know. I'm not sure. But anyway, we could have in our group just one group JavaScript programmer, and it was revolutionary because I don't need to hire other people, other languages to do the back end. So this person. The, 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 the main person who has created Node.js, he leaves for Go. And you can, you can just check it out that this person has uh, said go bye-bye. So he leaves Node.js for Golang. So he said, don't do, in another words, he said, don't do your backend with, Node, with JavaScript on Node.js, use Golang. Okay, so, if you go among these 100 packages, then you can see that we can do, of course, web application, network server, mobile application, machine learning, image processing, and look at this one, you can even create crypto. So you can, you know, it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a cool language. Anyway, with, I, I haven't explored all the packages, but I want to do that. And um, in terms of, Concurrency, you can read this stuff. So, so this is the, the part that I really want to underline here. Some Many people I heard, they say, why I should learn Go? Because Go is Google language. Well, it was a Google language, then they made it open source. 
so many companies can use it, then there are lots of satellite companies that they are subcontracted of Google, then Google is the contractor, then they say, I want you to use Go, so they use Go. Many of the companies, they see how nice it is, then they use Go. And here is a list, and this list is back in 2019, okay? Today maybe it's longer, so just, just check it out. I'm gonna give you this PowerPoint, so YouTube, Dropbox, Apple, Google, well, Bitbucket, all of these companies here are using Go in some part of their system, Docker, Mozilla, GitHub. Then, you know, we can go, the list goes and on, MongoDB, Facebook, Intel, Twitter, I, I mean, all, all, the, all the big players. Then we can continue, and these are the companies, and the list is, is not exhaustive. You know, can continue. These are the companies using Golang, and I'm going to give you this. So you have it. So here, I just wanted to give a little bit more importance to Go language. So if you think that JavaScript is important, then you should consider Golang as an important uh, language. All right. So this is uh, the first piece of code that we have written, actually, we didn't write this. And what we wrote is, we just cut, cut and pasted of the thing. So I have one. Uh, so if you have created a, a, a directory on your desktop or somewhere, you go to that directory. I'm going to not file. I'm going to just change directory. I'm going to go to uh, workshop. I'm going to go to this final here. OK, so I'm in the final. I'm going to create a new file. Then I'm going to call it. Uh, okay, I can call it struct embedded go. So here is my file. OK. So as we know, first you start with the package main here, right? And that is by purpose. Look, I put import, okay, FMT. This is the that I stream that we were. Then I'm gonna put in here. Okay. And you see this FMT is underlined red because Go is controlling your formatting, your whole code. And you cannot write something that you are not using. If I put my cursor here, it said imported but not used. OK, so in other, like in C++, uh, you can you know, import. You see sharp, you can import and not use. But here, it doesn't let you uh, to import it and not uh, use it. OK, so uh, now we, we're going to use it. We're going to write something and we're going to use it. It's OK, so if I do a save, uh, this is what I want to show you. If I say save, it disappeared because it's it's just take it out. It doesn't let you use it. Uh, I mean, import that FMT if you don't want to uh, use it. OK, all right. So this is a workshop and I should have talked theory, but we don't have a choice since uh, since it's a new language. OK, so Right here is struct, okay? So you all know what is a struct, okay? You have heard about the struct, so write struct. I'm gonna give it a name. Let's say teacher struct. Give it some field. So as you can see, I have the keyword type. The name of my struct is teacher. So for people who have never heard about a struct, a struct is like a class a lighter weight of the class. Do not forget, these people are people behind C language. In C language, the limitation of making object, doing object oriented, is to creating a struct and underneath the struct, a method. So this is the, the limitation of object oriented. So C is not object oriented, we all know, but we can just do a simulation of object oriented. So we are encapsulating our data inside the struct, 
And then underneath the struct, like a separate block, we're going to create a method. And this is what we do in Golang, OK? And why we do this in Golang, actually, because those three people who have created the uh, paradigm of object-oriented, they arrive to a point that object-oriented is not helping in all the in all cases in like in general, it doesn't help. I, I mean, not in all the cases, it helps the maintenance. This is what I mean. So making object oriented is not always a good decision. All right, so it could be shocking for some of you, but if you talk to some seniors programmers, they're gonna tell you never use object oriented. And I heard this many times, never use object oriented at all. And, uh, so, so what should I use? What can I do? Well, you use composition. Well, those people who are genius, who are you know involved in huge project during the last 40 years, those people who have created object oriented, when Google, the most important company, asked them, create me a new language, they decide no more class. So in the world of Go, there is no class. So if we consider struct like a lightweight class, then Go is object oriented. If we don't consider struct like a lightweight class, and we say, look, class, it's a place that you are, the, the data and the behavior are encapsulated together, then, well, it's not object oriented. Well, my idea is Go, it is object oriented because it has a struct and uh, so I can encapsulate my data inside the structure, but uh, it's not object oriented in the sense that C sharp is. It's not object oriented in, in the sense that Java is. Why? Because I do not have inheritance. Inheritance is a poison for uh, most of the design. Okay, and this is not my <laughs> word poison. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go that far. But many people. Uh, senior people told me and they have this. They never do object oriented. I have an Excel file. We're going to go through it two, three minutes. Then you see. So about the syntax, the teacher is a type and it's happened to be a struct. OK, I have another type, which is interface. So interface is the base of the behavior and a struct is the base of the data. So when I put struct and interface all together, and we're gonna see how this will be, uh, this will be replace that kind. I mean, replace, uh, re not replace this. Will be, instead of making an object, okay, encapsulating both behavior and data. So we make our struct, we make our behavior, and we use it like that. Okay, and of course we have to uh, pass the struct to the behavior, the struct to the behavior, and we're gonna do it. Another thing which is interesting here, not very important, but interesting is I'm going to create here a field inside my struct and I'm going to put the type after. So it's not like other languages that you put the type on the left side of the variable name. First, you put the variable name, then the struct, the, the type, sorry. So here I have a teacher which has three fields, first name, last name, and field. It is. So this is my first stroke, and it's a stroke teacher. All right, so I haven't created an interface. So I want to create it directly a function. I have my function name. I want to create another function, okay? I'm going to create a function. I'm going to give it a name, okay? And the name will be full name. I have a parenthesis in front of the name of the method and this is my input okay then i have an output string so this function for now doesn't have any input but it has an output okay which is a string here so for my c plus plus classes if they are here we talk about function like a black box which takes input right and it has the magic word return here. 
and it's returning something. So it's returning, this is the output. You see, this look at the similarity kind of to, um, to C language. Now, this is struck is the data part, and this is the behavior part. This both together in another language, we would put it in the same like block, and we would create a class. But now I have this function here, and I have this type here, and I want to relate them together. I'm going to put my cursor here on the left side of full name. I'm going to open a parenthesis here. On the left side of full name. Then I'm going to enter T, which is a local name, local variable of type teacher. So at this moment here, OK, we call this place, this placeholder here, we call it a receiver, OK? So what this does this receiver, it just connect this method, this function, full name, to the struct teacher. This means that, so let me just write something here. So I'm going to uh, create a variable. And uh, if I do T, you see I have access to the method with basic like this. So my temp here is concatenating first name and last name, and it's going to return temp. Did you see that, you know, these are part of the control of the Golang? You see, okay, return doesn't have anything to return, so it's underlined. It's a wrong number of return uh, values, whatever. But temp is more interesting. So temp declared but not used. It doesn't let you, and if you want to compile it, it won't compile till you use it. You cannot import something or do something or add something and not using it. All right, so what is it, this receiver here? So when I told you that it is object, but it's not the same way that Java is, okay? So suppose now I'm going to go to my main. Okay, I'm going to create here. open my struct, then I'm going to give it name. I'm going to give it um, the second one is last name, so I'm going to give it sing. Okay. Programming. My teacher one in my main is underlined red. I put my cursor to declare but not use. I know I'm repeating this every 30 seconds, but I want you to, to see how they control, they control their, uh, their, their formatting. Now I'm going to write here teacher one. I put the dot operator and look at what you see. And you see first name, you see last name, you see field, which are the data related to this teacher one. Okay. And at the same time, we see full name. So full name, I can invoke it with the dot operator. Then I put use it as a receiver and I put it on the left side of the name. OK, all right, so I can just save this. I have my data. I have one function. Then I have my main. OK, I'm going to go to my terminal. And one of the beauty of fierce code is this integrated terminal. So I'm going to do new terminal. Then you see it goes to user, user, desktop, workshop, final. So what do I mean is it goes directly to the place that I have my file struck embedded. Then I'm going to do go run the name of the file, struct embedded.go. All right, so <laughs> it's funny when I run it, nothing came out. Well, because we are not print on the console anything. So <laughs> it's normal that this teacher one full name, it's going to execute this and it's going to return a temp. So this will be returning a temp, but I'm not telling him that uh, I put it on the console. Okay, I'm going to add here an FMT 
which is you remember in the hello world, we saw the package to uh, print on the console. Then I'm going to do the print LN. Okay. And now I put it here. So look, my FMT is underlined red. Okay, undeclared name FMT. It doesn't understand FMT because I don't have an FMT. Let's save it. As soon as I control S, I have my import added to, to this. And it does this every time I need a package. It's gonna add it here. So now I have an import FMT. It says, okay, now that you are using it, it's good. So let's rerun this thing to see if something come up. All right, so I have on my console the Ali Singh, which is the result of my concatenation. All right, so I'm going to wait here like um, seconds. If you are writing this, you can write it. Again, I talk a lot and I, I, I sometimes I go fast and uh, so don't be frustrated if you miss something, just listen to it. If your level are different and you, you just, your ears get used to some terms. If you have never heard about object oriented, now you are get, you know, you, you're going to see it like next semester. It's not, it's not rocket science. Your teacher will explain to you in one, two courses and you, you get it like any other things that you learned this semester. All right, so just to make it clear, so what is the, uh, when we do it, when uh, I pass it on the left side, so how about if I pass it on the right side? So I'm gonna just copy this, okay? I'm going to try to this time. I'm going to give it another name. Let's say full time two. Okay. Then I'm going to just take this from here. Okay. And I'm going to close this. I'm going to put it inside. So now, in this case, you see the difference. Now my full name, instead of get having opening a receiver here. Okay. I'm going to pass the object or this truck here as an input. Okay. So this means that I can do a call like we do in C language. I can do a call of this function and pass a teacher here. So I'm going to go here to my main and uh, I'm going to call that okay, full name two. Then I need an object teacher because my input here is a teacher, right? So I'm gonna, I have one teacher, which is here. I'm gonna put it here. So I have teacher one, right? It's gonna return me a temp. Again, I'm gonna put it in. Here we are. So now, <clears throat> Let's re-execute this thing. And now I have two times Ali Singh. So we were capable to do this once by invoking the method over the object. Okay. And I, I, I give myself the permission of calling this an object, even though it's a struct, but it's a structure. So it's an object, it's encapsulated here. Okay. And invoking with the dot operator. So it's part of the object. It's related because of that receiver. And here in the second one, the full time, the full name two is getting an input. So now it's getting an input. Okay. And this is how we call it. All right. So now that I have this, I'm going to add up here. Let's add up. Let's put it on the or, or here doesn't I don't think it matters. So let's add up another structure. So I have this time type course struct. So this will be a structure course. 
and it has a title. It has a content, right? All right, so now I want you to pay attention here. Now I have a second stroke, okay? Which has a title and which has a content. And here it is something that uh, they have decided to create in um, Golang, okay? So if I, I had here, you see, I had a struct teacher. This is a struct teacher. And the type is teacher, you see? Okay. So if I go ahead here and I say my course struct has a title, has a content, and it has a teacher. That's it. Just the type. So imagine just to, to make it, you know, clear in the analogy. This is what we are writing here. Just the type. I don't have a variable name because the variable come at the left side. OK, I just have the type. So this is what we call the embedded typing or the embedded that I, I put the name on the file, the uh, embedded embedded structs. So you see this teacher is embedded inside the course. OK, it's not composition. This is embedded. OK, this is not composition. OK, and I tell you why and we're going to explain it. So give me five minutes. This is not composition. This is being embedded. OK, actually, what I want to say and we're going to see it in practice is when you are embedding this struct inside another, I mean, the, the struct teacher inside another course, it's like it's like taking these fields OK, and putting them here. So those field, okay, and even the method with this, the method full name, this one, okay, will be part of the course, okay? So uh, it's not like composition, and we can do composition, and we, we're going to try composition too right after. But for now, this is uh, the um, teacher. Okay, so now the teacher and embedded. So now I'm going to create a method. Okay, uh, or a function. Okay, I'm gonna pass course to this function. This is again. I'm gonna mention it. This is a receiver. I don't know, a receiver e compress or i. I don't remember. No, it's like that. It's receiver. <clears throat> I'm gonna give it a name. Okay. No input, okay, no nothing to return. All right. What were my uh, my uh, like attributes of course? Well, title and content. So I'm gonna do FMT print ln. Actually, I'm gonna make two of them. Then I'm gonna say title. Let's put it in code title, right? Then I have my C, which is a pointer to the object that I, my local variable. So I'm going to put dot operator, okay? Look at what you see here well. And I don't know if I put this over there, so it's, it's not disappeared. I have title, I have content. So I, I have content, then I should have title, title here. But look at what I have access to, first name, last name, field, okay, and even the full name, okay? So that's the difference between embedding a struct inside another struct and one struct to be composed of the other one. When it's composed, okay, you have to pass by the composite. So you do the first object, the composite dot, then you have access to. So that's in embedded, you have access directly. Okay, so first I go with the title. Here we go. That's the title. Then I'm going to write here. Then I'm going to write. Okay, now we're going to do FMT println. 
What we had in the teacher, well, if I put the dot operator, I see it, but I want to do it like this too. First name, last name, and the field, right? But my full name here is doing a concatenation of first name and last name. Is it possible? Under struct, C call full name. Well, let's try it. Okay. Then I'm going to I'm going to write first name and okay. I'm going to just make it short. I'm going to just write name. Okay. Here, now I do full name. So again, pay attention. This full name. Okay, it's a method that it's bind here to teacher. But because course is uh, teacher is embedded inside course, then course has directly access to the full name. <coughs> All right. so this is the full name, so first name and last name and field left on. I do an FMT print LN. OK, I do field here. And C and buff, I have access to field, which is an attribute of my upper struct. The struct. Uh, teacher. So I'm going to leave it here for a second so you can. OK, so I have my teacher, right? Then I used full name, I used full name too, okay? Put it as a comment here. So in my output, I have a little console on my output, it doesn't bother me, okay? Don't worry about the teacher one because we're gonna use it now. So now I want to create a struct course. I'm gonna do course one is equal to course. Okay. So what was the, the field of my course? Let's go see. So I have a title, I have a content string, and I have teacher. So my struct teacher, which is teacher one, I'm gonna use it here. I'm gonna give it a title and a content. So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna write title, blank, content, um, composition. And I need to write the struct teacher here, which I have one, I, an instance that I have created, I can pass it here. So my red line of teacher one um, vanished because I use it. Now I have my course one, which is course one declared, but not used. Okay. So in my method detail, I have a receiver in this placeholder. I have received here. My struct course is bind to detail, method detail. So this means that if I want to use the method detail, I want to invoke it over the struct with the dot operator. I do it as I did it here, full name and teacher. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to do course one dot detail. Here you go. This is how we have embedded to struct, okay? And we are using uh, this method. So by calling this method, by invoking it over the object, course one, it should give me the title, the content, right? The full name, which is the first name and last name coming from the teacher and the field of the teacher, which is, uh, I, I, I could, I, I have access to it based on the outer struct, which is the course, right? Okay, so let's just run this guy. <coughs> let's open this a little bit. So what I have, I have the title Goland, the content composition, and <coughs> the name Ali Singh, which come from the teacher Ali Singh, right? And the field is programming, okay? This is how we, we do it in, uh, in Golang. So I wanted to give you a first example like this of how we use the struct. 
a little bit of explanation here. We have not used uh, interface yet because I need to explain to you something before we go to interface. But I explained to you that we do not have a class. We have a struct and underneath struct, we have a function. And if I'm passing here as a receiver, a struct to a function, a struct to a function, then I can invoke that method or function on that object, an instance of that object struct. Okay. So what is the beauty of this? Well, this is very interesting. I'm going to just make it short for you. In object oriented, I have a method. I, sorry, I have a function or method which is belong to an object. Here I have one method. Any receiver that I put here, it will be, so I, here if I have 10 different struct, I can pass them. I can use full name over all of those struct. So you see how it becomes general and it becomes very large in terms of explanation. All right. So we said that in Golang, there are two things which is extremely important. One is the paradigm of object oriented, the OOP, special inheritance is no more. OK, the second one is the web development. So we are still in the paradigm of the OOP. OK, so for explaining this, I'm going to open a file that I'm going to give you. I'm going to go through a little things that last night I just created. I'm not good at drawing, but I tried. Let me see if there is something i'm gonna i'm gonna answer all your question okay just write it here so we're gonna answer it uh at the end okay so i saw your your question but i'm gonna answer all of this at the end all right so let's go to <coughs> this file here all right, so I need to talk five, 10 minutes in here to underline this problem, okay? And there is no, um, uh, there, there is no way we, we have to talk about it. So at certain point we did object oriented. Why we do object oriented? When I ask this, most of the students tell me reusability of code. Well, yeah, it's an advantage which is reusability of code. But the most important thing that we do object oriented is to make the maintenance cheaper, the maintenance easier. We are splitting over different entities, packages, module or class or function, the responsibilities. And we look at our design. We know that if there is a problem where we have to go, okay? So getting debugging, after we have shipped the software is part of the maintenance. But the maintenance is not just that. The maintenance is adding new functionalities too. So in maintenance, we do two things. We are solving the problem of our version of software and we are adding functionalities. And different books, different uh, places, they have different, different numbers, <clears throat> but usually, about 70%, 75% of the budget of the software goes to the maintenance. Why? Because we have a big number of developers. We develop the software, we ship it, but we have to keep a small number to do the maintenance over many years. So it's a game, it's a operating system, whatever it is, we need to keep it for five to 10 years and to support it. And because it's very long, usually the maintenance is even more expensive than the development of the software. So here the, the why in Go, they, the people who have created OOP, they said no more OOP, is because we have some, uh, some fundamental problem in order to do uh, OOP. The problem with OOP is we have some assumptions from the very beginning. So look at this. I have a class person here. Then suppose it's a game. I gave this example a couple of weeks ago in a class, then I liked it. So I give the same example. 
So I have class person here. I have a class Batman. I have a class Spider-Man. And I have a game. So there are many classes around. But here I have a Spider-Man, which has some methods, behavior. And I have Batman, which has some methods and behavior. And these are two different guys. Okay. While we were doing this, okay, we never thought that we could have this. So we took for sure that we would never have a spider bat. So the customer or the manager, whoever, comes and says, okay, Spider-Man is nice, Batman is nice, but now we want a spider bat. And what is the spider bat? It's a new actor, a new personage of our game that has some behavior of the Spider-Man and some behavior of the Batman, okay? So it's kind of half Spider-Man, half Batman. We never thought about it. Another example here, I it just came to my mind. You have animal here, then you have a fish, then you have a snake. Yeah, you never thought there would be a crocodile, which is like half fish and half snake. Anyway, now we have this. Why we do object oriented? Because we want to do the maintenance. Easy. That's why we did for 35 years, 40 years of object oriented. So in this little example, I want to show you, is it really making the maintenance easier? Easier, cheaper? So the maintenance will be easier and cheaper if I want to add something to this design, like I want to be agile, right? I want to add something to this design, then I don't need to change other classes as much as possible. So as I say always, we don't have one design. Okay? I never say in my class that this is the best design. I said this is just one design. Maybe it's a good design, but we have different design. So I just have had fun and I wrote a couple of different ways. You see, okay, uh, if I am in a language that supports multiple inheritance, then I can do spider bat is inheriting from Spider-Man and a Batman. So, yeah, a couple of problem here. Right away, we see that this is not a good solution. First of all, if I have a method in Spider-Man and in Batman, which are the same, then I have the diamond problem. And most importantly, if I have a language that doesn't support multiple inheritance, then what should I do? Well, this is a way of doing. This is another way of doing. I make a decision. I say spider man, spider bat will inherit just from Spider-Man. Okay. And it has like 10 methods like that. I don't need to rewrite them in spider bat because those 10 methods are part of the behavior that spider bat has. But how about that 5, 10, 20 methods that are in the Spider-Man and are not in spider bat? Well, I can overwrite them, right? I should override them. So I'm going to override them. If somebody invoked those methods, then I would say, oh, actually this one is a spider, but it doesn't do. But does it, so all of this is, is doable, but does it make the design easier? So conceptually, I have a problem here. The conceptual problem is even more important than overriding the method here. This is inheritance, and I'm saying that spider bat is a spider man. So conceptually, spider bat is a spider man, now, which is not true. Spider bat is not a spider man, okay? Because we are overwriting many methods here in the spider bat, saying that it, not that we are overwriting to make it another way, but we are saying it, it's not, a return not. I go here, down. I can do the same thing in everything from the Batman. And I say, OK, you know, the same story that we did over there, then we could do it with Batman. OK, so I'm going to make it a little bit smarter. I'm going to create an interface here. And so I have to create the interface after I want to add spider bat. So at the beginning, I just have this triangle. So I'm going to add this interface here. I Batman shared behavior and I put so this Batman and the spider bat will be under the same umbrella, right? 
And I could have another one. Actually, I should put, I didn't put it. I should put another one. I spider, what is it? I spider man shared behavior, another here, another um, interface here. So that spider, but we implement both of the interfaces. Okay, or one interface with both of the methods we are in common. I'm a different design. So this is good too, because now when somebody look at it, they say, okay, he didn't met a conceptual problem that we have here by this is a, okay? It says spider bat here is from this type interface, right? And from the other type interface, implementing both interface. So this is conceptually more right, right? And then a spider bat, okay, directly could inherit from person. So a spider bat is a person, then it's implementing the two interfaces. So this is another way. Okay, so there are, you know, lots of other ways of doing it, or I can say, why do I do all of this? You can just put spider bat from the very beginning here in the middle. I have 10 methods, 20 methods in the Spider-Man, no problem, I'm going to rewrite them here. I have 10, 20 in Batman that Spider-Bat has, I'm going to rewrite them here. And I have a new class, okay? But again, conceptually, is it the best thing? Well, I, for in, in order to maintain in this one, I have lots of work to do. In this one, I have more work to do in the other one. These are the problem, and this is at the first layer. So now imagine if I have another actor coming, and again is something between Batman and other methods of Spider. So two methods of Batman, two methods of Spider Man, Spider Bat, and two methods of Spider Man. So what should I do now? Again, I have to change my all interfaces, or I have to, you know, create another class and add it here from person. But conceptually, it's no Batman, no Spider Bat, no Spider Man. You know, all of this and more of the uh, way solution, okay, we could do it. And I'm not here to prove you that any of them is better than the other one, okay? And I hope there are one that I, I prefer, like using interface, but I'm, I'm not here to tell you which one is the best, okay? But I'm here to tell you this. So how about instead of using from the very beginning, okay, the relation of is a, I use the relation of has a. And so Spider-Man, instead of inheriting from person, Spider-Man will have a person. So suppose in the constructor, in other languages which have a constructor, uh, I, I do here a composition, for example, and my Spider-Man is composed of a person and my Batman is composed of a person. All right. Then my boss comes to me and say, add up spider bat. Okay, I don't need to change anything in this part. I'm going to create my spider bat and my spider bat will have one spider man and will have one Batman. And I'm going to use the part of the spider man and the part of the Batman that I want in my spider bat. So if there are in Batman, there are 20 methods. I'm going to use five of them. In my spider bat and if my spider man there are 100 methods i'm going to use three of them so this is the the, the percentage that the spider bat is a spider man and is a batman so because of that okay uh, most of the people uh say composition over inheritance me um, i'm open i say different design different different context Okay, but Go, Go is using composition and is using embedded. So what we saw there was embedding the stroke, right? And we can even do composition. So that's the, the why I explained you this for like 10 minutes, because I wanted to underline that. Why is that, that Go, in Go, there is no inheritance. Okay, there is no class and there is no inheritance but there is embed, embedding one struct. So why I have to say one struct is another struct. One struct has the struct teacher, like in our code, has the struct teacher, and it's gonna use the part of the struct teacher, okay, that he wants. If there is a part that he doesn't want, okay, he, he won't use it, that's all. So this is the 
advantage of doing <coughs> composition over um, inheritance. Okay, all right. So uh, it's 1.50 and we have started at 12.30, okay? Let's take it 10 minutes, okay? Fast, fast, make your coffee and come back at 2 p.m., okay? And we're gonna continue from there. We have another half a, half a minute at least to do another example. So just see you in 10 minutes, okay? So break. Dara. Dara. Yeah. Hi, thank you. No problem. Um, so we need to be done by 2.45 max. Okay. Uh, I think we have it scheduled till 2.30, but I mean, it's amazingly interesting that if it goes to 2.45 is good, it's just because the team needs to, com to go completely to the next workshop that starts at 3 o'clock. Perfect. Sounds good. Perfect. So I'm going to I'm going to stop at 2:30 then I give them 15 minutes for the question. Thank you. All right. You deserve you. your break now. Go for it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
okay so guys let's slowly but surely continue with another another aspect of the language <coughs> so i'm going to create here this Okay, so I'm going to create here another file, and I can call it now. I every time I have a main function, I package main, right? I have an import here, but I'm going to do it a little bit, like in two minutes. All right. The idea here, we have seen the type struct, and now we want to get introduced to another type, which is the type interface. So we have the interface, and we have the struct, and we saw the functions. We know what is an interface, okay? An interface is, a student told me some, some, some times ago, an interface is a class that we cannot instantiate it. And actually it's funny, but it's it's kind of right. I mean, in practice, you have an interface, you cannot instantiate it, but this is not the, the real definition of interface, okay? And when I ask what is an interface, so I get lots of different, you know, explanation to you what, for me is interface. So this is an interface, I call it interface geometry. This interface has two method, okay? This is one method, which is area. This is a classic example of OOP that I took. So this is the area and it's gonna return a double. And double, it's in Golang, it's a float, okay? Float 64. And if you think about it, when they say the language is direct, it's kind of just, you know, one of the basic stuff with this one. So why we write it double when we could have, you know, float on four byte and uh, float on eight bytes. So if I have a float on eight byte, which 64 divided by eight bit is eight byte, then I write it directly float 64. But anyway, so this is what uh, we say that it's direct. So the other one is perimeter. Again, it's going to return float 64. So if in a in a regular lecture in a class when we talk about interface we have time and we can talk about like a long time but here uh, let me tell you this what is an interface in OOP an interface is a type is more than a type an interface is an umbrella. An interface is a regroupment. That's why we do interface, okay? Uh, some people say an interface is the class is promising to the interface to implement that function. Well, I take out the interface and still as a human, I can remember that I can write that explanation, that I can implement that method. And the opposite is, okay, so the, your class will, will, will promise to the interface to implement. So how about those methods that are not into the interface? So we don't have any promise, for, so we leave them. Anyway, so this is not why we do an interface. We do an interface just to regroup, put under the same umbrella. So here, when I open this, and I put an interface here. I want to show to the next programmer because we want to make the maintenance easier, do not forget. Uh, I want to show to the next programmer that, you know, even Batman is part of the person family, right? But in this context, Batman and spider Bat belong to this type. It means that they are, they are making a group together. In class, I give the example, this is 
the family. This is the dad and this is, let's say, my sister and this is me. And uh, if, and this is part of another family, a cousin of mine. So suppose you have, if you have another triangle here, and this cousin of mine belongs to that family and me, I belong to this family. But something common between me and my cousin is we both sing. Then we could have an interface singable or I singable here that both classes, me and my cousin will implement that. And when somebody wants to maintain this application, we look at it, they say, oh, so this guy belongs to that family. At the same time, he belongs to this regroupment. In OOP, we love to regroup. You see, this is a regroupment and this is a regroupment. Okay, so that's why we say an interface is. So this is the real fundamentally the, the use of the interface. We want to make the maintenance easier. So. So I, I cut it here, so I, I'm not going to continue with this thing. This is a very long uh, story, so we don't have time. We just have 20 minutes to finish with this second example. So I have a type geometry here, a, a, type, geometry, a type interface, which I call geometry. It has two header of a function, okay? Now I'm going to create my struct. So in this case, I want to have two struct. Okay, one is the rectangle. And another one will be another, let's say circle. A circle has a radius, radius, float, 64. And my rectangle has a width, and a length. So I have two stroke, one rectangle and one circle. Then I have this geometry, which is the interface. Okay. In different languages, like in Java, when we want to, suppose this is a class and we want to implement this interface, this class want to implement this interface, we have to use the word implement the interface. In C sharp, we put that this, this to show it. Here uh, in Go, it's a little bit different. If the struct rect and, or the struct circle wants to implement geometry interface, they just have to implement these functions. So we have to create these two functions. And now we know how on the left side of the name of the function, we can pass it like a receiver, those, uh, those struck. And at that moment, if this struck is implementing both of these functions, okay, means that implicitly this struct rect is implementing this interface. And why is it important? So we're gonna get to it. And I'm going to tell you why we are doing this example. So we're going to go here and we're going to create our function. So the first function uh, will be the area, right? And this area will return a float. This area, it's going to have a placeholder or a receiver here. I, I like to write it again here, receiver. Okay, then this receiver will be the, this struct rect will be the receiver of area. Okay, but this is not enough. Well, I haven't put juice here yet, and it's going to return a float. Okay, I'm going to put r length. Width. Okay, so now my rectangle in this moment here, he has implemented this function area, which belongs to the interface. There is another one, which is the perimeter. If I go ahead here and I just copy this, okay, and I write here, it's gonna return a float and it's this, 
plus this. Something like this. So this will be the perimeter of the rectangle. So now my struct rect has implemented both of the function and both of the function at this moment here, when I finish this implicitly means that my struct rect has implemented the interface geometry. All right, so now I have to do the same thing for, because I want to implement it in the circle. So I have to do the same thing for circle. Right, okay, so I'm going to just copy. I can't copy and pasting. I'm not that lucky in copying and pasting, but you know, sometimes it works. So here you have a circle, okay. Then the circle. The circle area is uh, I need here to import Okay, these are the two that we need to. Okay. So now I can circle. So the area of the circle will be this time bridges. I Okay, so this is the uh, area of the circle and the perimeter of the uh, circle. Mm -hmm. So I hope I did a mistake in the area of the circle and the perimeter, but I think it's it's correct. So just bring this down a little bit here. Make it because this is going to be a little bit longer. So FMT, I haven't used it yet, so it was vanished. So I have my type here, which is the geometry. I have the two struct, right? Then I have implemented the functions here of the geometry. Okay, so by doing this, what does it mean? It means that my two struct, okay, are from type of struct, like those families that we were giving this as an example of interface, but they are under the umbrella of the geometry too. So I have a rectangle, which is a struct, but it, it is from the type interface too. How can I use this? Well, the beauty of it is if I go ahead here, and I function, the beauty. So if I write, a function, let's say measure, okay, as the type geometry here to my function. So I'm going to do enter here. So this function measure that I'm going to call inside my main, now it taking as an input, right? As an input, it take the interface. So whatever is from the type interface, it should be right here. So first of all, I'm going to just use FMT here, then my local variable is G, so I'm going to put G. 
So I want to just bring this FMT here. So now, FMT, is it added here at the top? Okay. And then I go ahead again, I do FMT. And then, okay, G dot area. What I'm doing here? Well, I have the area which has an implementation for rect and an implementation for circle. Then I'm passing it here, like I'm invoking it here over the variable G from the type interface. So what's happening here exactly? We call this polymorphism. This is exactly what we do in another way, of course, we do it in object oriented. So let me just add another FMT. Other one is the perimeter. All right, so my measure takes the interface, right? And the interface, it could be either rectangle or circle. So I'm going to go ahead here in my main, I'm going to create one stroke of each of them so one rectangle and one uh, circle so i look just i have my stroke in the rectangle i have to pass two float and in uh, in uh, circle okay i have to pass one i'm gonna go here to now i'm gonna do r open the curly braces here so width is three and call it height, right? Length. And uh, length is five. So here is my struck and the other one is the circle. So I'm going to yes. The circle has just the radius, which is five. Okay, so now in my, so I have created the, the two structs, so I have my method measure now that can take any of them. At this moment here, we are talking about polymorphism. So I'm going to do measure R, I'm going to do measure C, which is the and this is how we invoke polymorphism in Go language. So I call the method, I invoke the method over the object, right? And based on the object, it's going to go to the, the area definition that it's the right one. So here my area definition is this one for rect. And for the circle, it will be the other one. OK, so this is polymorphism in Golang. If you so let's run it first to see if this thing is working. So I'm going to run interface. And I, if I open this, if I go to the execution here, OK, so on, I have measure first, let's say measure R. So I have three and five, which is the execution of this here. Right. Then I have 15 for the area and 16 for the perimeter. Then I have the second one, which is the measure C. So C is passing here and C is from the type geometry, which is an interface. And now I'm passing, I'm, I'm invoking the area. Now it goes because it's a circle. It knows to which one to go. And it's going to invoke another one, 78 and uh, 31. Okay. So this is polymorphism. So if you, if it's the first time that you see this, well, it's a little bit bizarre because we don't have a class and you guys are used to do classes. And even though we have a struct and like a struct is supported in C++, 
for example, it's rare that I'm rare. I use it all the time, but for, for most of the people, it's rare to use stroke. They go to class and they don't go to, to stroke. But for our uh, my student of the two groups of uh, the, the first programming course that they have, you have talk about struct. So you understand what is struct, you understand what is a function. So interface, you haven't seen interface, and this is the first time that you see interface, but don't worry, you're going to see a lot of interface in the following semesters. So uh, the beauty of, of this is we are, as you know, this guy is saying here, Rob Pike is saying data and behavior are two distinct concepts in Go. Data and behavior. So behavior in the interface, right? And data in the struct. Comma, not mixed into a single notion of a class. Rob Pike. Who is Rob Pike behind C language? Who is Rob Pike behind Golang? Who is Rob Pike, a, a true genius? Who is struck by is one of the major contributor of creating the concept of class. And now he after 35 years, 40 years, he said no more class and let's do it data and uh, behavior. As you can see, well, I'm new in Go, okay? And the only disadvantage that I see is the number of line that I have to create. Maybe there is shorter way, and I, I, I haven't learned it yet, but this redeclaration of the methods here, you see, these are, I think, I mean, I think it's longer, but I did the same code in Java and, you know, in object oriented, and it was like 30 line, I think, and Java is a long language. So if you do it in Python, it will be even, even shorter than that. So this is the only disadvantage. Maybe this is not the way of, of doing it. Uh, we, I mean, I have done some, uh, about 10 design patterns. I tried some examples that I used to give in object oriented. I tried to recreate them here in Golang and with the struct and interface and they work beautifully. They are a little bit, you know, it takes time to really, really understand because if we think object, then now we say no more this class A is another class, but this class has another class. And this is a little bit of confusion, but if you do a couple of exercises, a couple of projects, then uh, it, will be, uh, it will be nicer. I just want to, I have a little bit of time, okay? What we have seen was struct, interface, things like polymorphism, okay? We have seen embedded struct. I just want to show you one development in a website because I just, all we talk was this part. So we almost covered the introduction to the language and etc. The language concept, composition, inheritance, etc. This part, I said, if time, let me at least just show you in five minutes just the code that uh, we have made in web development. Okay, so I'm going to give you the code after after uh, the workshop. So here I have two directories. Okay. I'm going to go to this web development too. I'm going to go to the last part. So the 10 steps that we are creating the website. Okay. And we're going to do it like next semester with, during our course TT4 Trends in Technology. We're going to do this example. So as you can see, you know, so let me just show you first of all, hello world. Then we are serving an HTML. We are adding some bootstrap in it. Then, uh, we are serving our HTML page by the render rendering method. Then we are implementing to the backend our rock, paper, scissor. Then we are talking about JSON, how backend and frontend with JSON they are talking. Then, uh, oh, 
I, I don't remember what I put here, but at the end is finishing up. So this is this is what we want to see. It completely go web server. Right. So what is it? This is a that game of rock, scissor, paper. Okay, and this is made. Uh, in Go and some part of it, of course, because if you want to execute it inside the browser, we don't have any choice just to use some JavaScript, right? So we have an HTML page and we have some JavaScript here, okay? So the interaction the user does with the buttons are with this part in the JavaScript, okay? And then it passing the JavaScript now, the, the the user, um, the user choices, it's passed by a JSON. So we wrap it in JSON, we marshal it, we send it to the backend, and in our backend, we unmarshal it. Okay, so we're going to see it in, in our TT4 class with the whole detail. So this is my goal, and what I want to underline here. You see this one single line here. So don't tell me that you have done. Uh, OK, I'm, I'm not going to call the languages, you know, different languages that you do and you do a backend and you have a server. So here it is a, a completely serious uh, server in Golang. That single line. So it's from the package HTTP, listen and serve on the port 8080. That's set. This is a server ready for production in Golang. And I mean, it's like mind blowing. So uh, what is it? So it's listening on the port 8080. So let's run this to see if this thing is running. So I am at 10. Finishing, so go run main.go. Okay, didn't launch the, it says, starting web server on port 8080, but it didn't launch it on port 8080, so there is a problem. Let's, let's launch it to see if we have a server here or not. So I'm, I'm a local host, right? 8080. Oh, that's the problem. So I have Tomcat, okay, which is, I installed it as a service. So service, I go to my Windows services here. Then I'm gonna go for Apache Tomcat here. Tomcat 9, I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna stop it. So now my, if I refresh this page, okay, so now it's turning around, so there is nothing. Okay, now I can redo my launch. So I'm gonna redo my launch. All right, so now it's working. Allow the access, and here we are on local 8080. We are we have this page. This page has been created with Bootstrap. It's a very simple Bootstrap I have, and the interaction here. You see, this is a complete MVC. If you look at it, it's a small application, but it's a complete MVC. So you see here, I have the view, right? And I can interact with the back end. Means that if I click on Caesar here, then I have player choose Caesar, computer choose Caesar, etc. So it has been lots of things happening. I'm ha sending it. This is my choice, and my because uh, I have here the back end. Okay, and in the back end, I'm using a random. So you see, for for my student and. C language, we have always this planting this seed, okay, inside my function round. Then I'm using it rand like I do 
in C++. We did it this many times together. So we are passing, we are planting the seed, we are creating a random, right? And this is my backend, my RPS here, which is my uh, rock, paper, scissor package, right? And when I click here, like this, I click on them, actually I'm interacting with the controller. So this is my view, and I'm interacting with my uh, with uh, my backend. So here is my controller here, you see? I'm playing with the controller, okay? Here we go. This is my controller. I have my view. I just have to add a database to this, and I will have a full stack just in this little small application. So this is something that I wanted to to show you that this is how we do with that single line here. We just did a production server here on the port 88 is really, really uh, bizarre. So we have, you know, some function handler uh, for my student in Python. We did a small exercise in the Django and you remember we had the uh, function handler. So here the function, this is the same, you know, function handler. So I don't know who copied who. <laughs> so people of Python copied Go or Go people. I, I don't know which one is that. But anyway, you, you see the relation between the language that at the end of your course, you can see. Uh, so this is so the handler. So and it's handling the function that we have the function. And we're going to go through this application uh, later. OK in next semester. So I'm going to do a control C to come out of this thing. So of course, this is going to crash because there is no Swiss thinking here, you see. And uh, all right, I had about five, six idea to talk about it, but we don't have time. And I hope the, uh, the, the whole idea was just to introduce you and just you know that there is a language called Go and for people who do TT4 with me next semester, well, you're going to see it deeper. You're going to use it as a backend. And uh, so you see it uh, a, a little bit more detail of it. And we just talk a lot about that part of the uh, composition embedded through OOP. And I hope you understood and you saw what is the problem of OOP that we are taking everything granted from the, we have some assumptions and we go with the assumption and we never think about the spider bat and that will make our maintenance hard, which is not impossible, but just make it hard. Okay, so let's see if you have question guys, uh, so you can write it here and I, I am gonna answer you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Nariman. Thank you, Mr. Kao. Yeah, yeah, so Sarah is asking, are you going to share the, the game? I'm going to share uh, all of this, yeah, yeah. I'm going to make a zip file and I'm going to like, upload it here. You, you guys, you can come and take it from here. So we have Salima who prefers object oriented, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not insisting that one of them is, is you know, absolutely better than another one. But um, you know, most of the people in the industry, they, they say composition is better. But anyway, um, okay, thank you, Mr. Zeruk. Like Mr. Kao, these people were made my teachers, so they liked the uh, the introduction to GoLang. And okay, we we have like five six minutes. I have a student here who asked a question that I forgot. What was it? At this one, how does the compiler recognize that the variable name is new? What do you mean? In, in, in let's go 
the that question question was way at the beginning when you started writing um, code after you, you talked about the compiler and I can't remember myself at what point he yes. or she asked the question to help you. Sorry, Dara. No, it's OK, but. But. Um, if, Maybe if the person is still there, they can ask. They can talk, yeah, yeah. So this is the first one that we wrote. Um, so in, in which 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 variable, if you can open and, and tell me which variable the compiler, maybe maybe it means that when it's embedded, how it can find the compiler, the the variable added to like course, if if I if I understand correctly, is is there any? Okay. When when I used FMT, throw the error. Um, which which error? Like FMT. I, I don't know which which one you said. Throws an error. Anyway, I don't I don't get it. What is it? But let let me let me just in in the three five minutes we have something interesting came to my mind. Let me explain it to you, or explain it to everybody. So as you can see, then we have an embedded here struct. So what happening? We have this teacher attributes will be available to the course. So think about it. We have a struct here, right? And because this is struct, we have this part of the embedded teacher inside this course. Course has access to the attributes of teacher directly. So we could do it like I can create a variable here, T teachers. And as soon as I do T teachers, this is no more embedded struct, but this is composition. So in this composition it means C, which is the course, now it will be composed. You see, this is underlined full name. The like course is no more have access to the full name. We have to pass by the struct, the, the struct teacher. So I'm going to do this, and you see, I have this T here, and which T is that? Is this T here? So now, if I do T, then I I could have access to full name. This is usually what we do when we do composition. So we have to pass by the embedded object here okay so this is one thing but the most importantly is how the compiler works here and how the compiler starting here it can access to the other object this is uh, we have seen this in other context you see for example okay i'm going to just open this and i'm going to write here var a variable. Suppose this is JavaScript and this is what a variable. We have seen or we will see that one of the major difference between war and uh, the other keyword for uh, to declare is war and I forgot what is the other one in JavaScript. But anyway, what is the importance of this war is this war on the fly, we can add to the scope of the war. Means that if I have here, I have declared a variable in JavaScript, huh? then I have here, let's say, multiple blocks. So I open here and I can again equal to something then I can again write here. Then I can add here variable. So what's going to happen in JavaScript? Till this line 22, the value of the variable is whatever is here. Suppose four. From line 24 and for the rest of the application inside the block or outside, it will be 10 if we didn't have this two. So, but because now we have this from line 24 to line 26, no matter I am inside the block 
or outside the block. It will be 10 from line 26, it will be 20. And from line 28, it will be something else, let's say 400. And this 400 stays for the rest of the application. So what is the explanation of this? Is adding to the block with wall, we are adding to the scope of the variable. So means that we have this scope of the variable, which is four. The scope of the variable becomes this on the fly. Scope of the variable becomes this, and the scope of the variable becomes this. Why I give this example? Because this is how it works here behind the scene. When I add teacher here, now the scope of my variables for the, the access of the course is not just these two variable, is adding those variables or the attributes of teacher to the scope of the course. So it's like kind of the analogy of how it works here. So I'm going to just take it out. I'm going to just leave it and just take this composition out. So because I want to give you this file and I think the rest of it is OK. So we still have. Yeah, so Mr. Moin said let a war and let let is the other one in JavaScript. And for let the scope of variable is not added, but for war it's uh, added. Um, <laughs> Golang is faster than Python. Golang is super fast. Is very, very fast. Nothing to do with Python, which is an interpreted language. No, 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 no. Go, go is, you can compare it with C++. It's super fast. And it's compiled much faster than C++. C++, when you have like 10, 20 classes, it takes time to compile in Go is. And the Go compiler is not written in C language. The Go compiler is written in Golang. So this is unique too. You know, most of the compiler are in C language, but Go compiler is written in Golang. We had a student here, Ronit Kumar, who wrote a compiler for Golang, and we presented the compiler, and uh, he, he was a great student, great programmer. He works for PayPal now in uh, Ottawa. And uh, so th that's why I know that we can, the Go compiler is written in uh, Go language. So that's why FMT was underlined until we use it at the end. Uh, yeah, if you don't use something in, in Go, if you don't use something, it's gonna take it out. And uh, in the library, so if I import an FMT library, then, uh, if I don't use it, it's, it's going to be deleted. If I write an FMT in the code and I haven't import the library, then it's going to be added to the, and it will be underlined, yeah. Is possible to use the functional programming in Go? Of course, absolutely, absolutely. So the functional programming is one step before the object oriented and absolutely. And this is actually based on the functional programming. Yeah. All right, guys, it's 2.45. I will be making the uh, wrapping the, the all the files and more examples that I wanted to give you. Then I'm going to upload it here. You can come and take it. OK, just give me like 10, 10, like 10 20 minutes. I'm going to do it. And uh, if you have you are interested in learning more Go, then we're, we're going to do it um, more or you can talk to me at college. All right, guys, take care and have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.
Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Hamid. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Mrs. Pan. Mr. Abdul Ghadir, what a pleasure. Thank you. 